So as we've been doing this retreat, we'll sit for 15 or 20 minutes. I'll give a few instructions related to the theme for tonight's talk. After settling or recognizing the settledness that's here, perhaps we can sense this as a kind of pleasure of renunciation, the pleasure of not having to move our body. We could keep adjusting the posture, but there is a subtle pleasure in just letting the body be still. Although we may feel those impulses to move, it is a kind of <clears throat> freedom or liberation not to have to move. Because we can just feel what it feels like to have the impulse to move. So that could be a theme for several minutes now, just feeling, opening, receiving the sitting body, the breathing body, And noticing all the subtle intentions to move. It's not about getting tight <laughs> about this, but curious. Can I feel this impulse to move? Can I feel what it feels like to not move? <laughs> Appreciating the freedom to allow things to be. And of course, if movement happens, that's okay. Just settling back into this curiosity about stillness in the sitting posture. A stillness that comes from interest and relaxation. interest in what it feels like to not have to move. You can even have a sense of solidity. Almost like a superpower not having to move. like a tree. I'm here, the body's sitting here, sits bones on the cushion or chair, hands touching perhaps, 
breath coming in, going out. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, just this. And again, being interested in the subtle pleasure that might be present, the pleasure of letting go or renouncing for a while, for moments at a time, the need to move. And we can always begin again and again and again. It's as if a kind, generous owner of a dog would say to the dog, after a busy day of the dog doing this and that, okay, dear, you get to just lie here. You get to just be here. You don't have to follow those impulses to sniff, to move, to go fetch. It's really okay. Just to be still. And in a more subtle way now, we can, when you're ready, get interested, curious about the renunciation of distraction. We could think about this and that, whatever our mind might be inclined to think about. And for a few minutes, you might find it very pleasing to give the heart permission not to have to think about this and that, not to have to figure anything out or evaluate or imagine. It may do those things, of course, but we're practicing giving permission for the heart, the mind to be still, to just be in the knowing. It's not about making thoughts go away. It's more about enjoying, appreciating the pleasure, stillness of body, and the relative stillness of the mind.
renouncing any subtle or not so subtle impulse to do something and even to be somebody. We're just giving permission to the heart to be as simple as it may want to be right now. Really appreciate the pleasure of that profound simplicity, just letting things be, not having to pick up to get identified with different impulses, but just to feel and feel and keep on feeling what's moving. And noticing the beautiful stillness in that allowing everything to move. You could call it peace.
and in the most subtle way, we're learning to renounce, to let go of clinging, attachment. So in a sense, the meditation object is this ongoing non-clinging, this ongoing letting go, letting go, letting go, allowing, allowing, allowing. And it doesn't really matter what the heart lets go of. Could be letting go of identifying with the pain in the body. Could be letting go of holding to some thought. Everything is passing away anyway. We're not making stuff go away or wanting stuff to go away. Letting go is really what happens when the heart aligns with nature. In the deepest way. little by little, cultivating, developing a taste for letting go, the freedom of non-clinging in all aspects of our lives. You feel ready, feel free to begin to move the body, open the eyes, Thanks, Matthew.
good time to just appreciate the momentum all of the retraining we've all done learning to value relaxation remembering to recognize awareness developing skills about sustaining present moment awareness learning how to get curious about what's subtle, the attitude in the mind, how the mind is relating. It's really not easy to get interested in what's subtle. Tonight I wanna to talk a little bit about renunciation, as you might've guessed from the guided instructions. And it's really one of the, you could say even, you could make a, a good case that it's really the overall foundational flavor of the Dhamma, of the Dharma, of the Buddhist teachings. And uh, it's okay, you know, if that word renunciation scares us because we all have the conditioning we have around sacrifice and having to let go of what we want, you know, sharing with my brother those sorts of things. And that basic fear of not having enough, being left out, not being included. So whenever we come across spiritual teachings that talk about renunciation, it will bring up all of that past conditioning. So often, you know, when Buddhists, especially those of us in the insight meditation tradition, when we talk about renunciation, we almost always say the joy of renunciation. It's just a little easier to swallow, but that can also sound a bit like uh, he's trying to sell, you know, sacrifice. <laughs> and uh, at least in our small groups that I've been part of, but maybe even in the larger groups, We've talked about the heat, tapas, the heat, the burning of that patient endurance of just being with our experience in that somewhat steady, somewhat willingness to begin again way, just to keep returning. Oh yeah, this is what the mind, the heart is knowing, feeling. It's like this. It, the underlying Vedana feeling tone is like this. The way the mind is relating is like this. And in that dynamic of being open to the way it is, this embodied <clears throat> life right here, you know, we feel so many impulses to react or to ignore or to hold on if it's nice, if it's exciting or juicy. But with that, whatever steadiness, whatever wisdom and awareness there is, there's that intuitive sense that any, any attempt to, for me to get something from experience is always a squeeze on the heart. It's always heavy. Whenever I'm living, thinking, acting, relating in a way that's coming out of the sense of a me who's trying to get something or get rid of something, that's tight. That's a tight way of being. And if we're present, we'll feel that. And I bring that up because in the end, that's all we're renouncing. You know, we have our forms like I walked us through tonight, you know, just sitting meditation, stillness in the posture, the attention, training the mind to be interested in the present moment. So we have these forms or even coming on retreat, eating the food we're served and sleeping in the place we've been assigned and following the schedule like everybody else for the most part. So outwardly, even monasticism, you know, outwardly there's a lot 
it's easy to get confused about renunciation because we think, well, when we see the monks and nuns, oh, you got to shave your head to be renounced. Or in uh, Theravada, early Buddhist tradition, you know, they don't eat any substantial food after midday. Okay, so I got to, that's why we have our main meal at noon to kind of sort of our lay version. And maybe even some of you are fasting or keeping it really light in the dinner, which is a very common thing for people to do when they're on retreat in our lineage for lay people too, just to keep the evening meal relatively light. You know, make sure the body has the, the nutrition it needs, but not more than what it needs. So these outward forms of renunciation can be very useful. But I think I mentioned on the group here at the retreat center today, the small group, but not to the larger group. You know, there are people who can be really good at that outward renunciation and still be very attached, clinging to being a min minimalist or whatever they might, clinging to being somebody who doesn't need much. You can get attached to anything including to the most sublime ideas like emptiness. I'm the one who knows about emptiness. You can get attached to that, my idea of what emptiness is. That uh, ordinary mind, we could say, the conditioned mind, habit-based mind, it's always looking for solid ground, and it will, not ashamed, it will look for solid ground anywhere and anything, including I'm the bad one, <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm no good. We can, our minds can get identified with that, can get fixed on that idea, just as much as I think I'm better than everyone. So as I said, it's really it goes right to the heart of the Buddhist teachings, even the term Nibbana, Nirvana, it really means the relinquishing of desire or of craving, a desire with attachment. The heart, you know, as a living being, there's going to be desire. Hopefully that's a relief. So we're not, it's not about getting rid of desire, but it's, it's relinquishing the misunderstanding of desire. We will feel desire. And that desire we feel is based on our conditioning because it's not going to be exactly the same for each of us. You know, sexual attraction is different. Our taste in food is different. What we think is cool will be different. But no matter the particular conditioning we have, we can if we're stabilizing present moment awareness, we can really see that any identification, any clinging, any attachment to my desires hurts. Doesn't mean we shouldn't act on some desires, but that the clinging, because it's subtle, but when we really see that the clinging to desire, the identification with it, is different than the desire. And with our more ordinary superficial mind, we clump the two together. We have desire, and it's my desire, and I'll be happy if I fulfill that desire. So the identity is infused with what is just a natural movement in the heart of any living creature to desire, you know to desire food and to desire shelter and things like that. And from our egoic point of view, we were afraid of abandoning that identity, that identification with desire, because we feel we won't take care of ourselves. <laughs> no, who else is going to take care of me if I abandon my attachment my identification with desire. But who or what is going to stop that desire from expressing itself in the world?
it's like a force of nature desire, but there's other forces of nature like the force of moral restraint, like, yeah, I really like that watch, but it's not my watch. <laughs> so we feel the attraction to that neat electronic device, whatever it might be, or that attractive person or those nice clothes or their good food. But whether, so that natural attraction is just nature. But also that wisdom, that moral wisdom that understands, like, is this the appropriate time? Is this okay for me to have? Is it being offered to me? Is there somebody better for this to go to? That also arises right there in the moment. And the two play together. But if we're, if that clinging comes in, that whole sense of self with the desire get infused, then we're, it's amazing how skillful we are and um, tenacious we are about protecting our desires. But it's mine. <laughs> There's a funny story that's told in the 12-step tradition, Alcoholics Anonymous especially, but there's a, a character uh, who was uh, someone who had done the 12 steps and, you know, gone to tons of groups and was one of the leaders. And he would speak at the 12-step conventions and he would tell this story that was a real hit. This is, you know, back probably 50 years ago now, but there is a recording of him on YouTube. Sandy Beach is his name, which is a great name. And, uh, but he talks about like this attachment to our way of doing things, our attachment to our desires as like a heavy rock. And he's out there drowning in the ocean, holding on to his heavy rock and all his friends, like in our case, Dharma friends are saying, drop the rock. <laughs> and you know, he hears them and he says, but it's my rock. And we see that with our friends and hopefully we begin to see it with ourselves. Like that's one of the great things about retreats is we see the mind, the habit-based mind, a desire arises, like a, we have a memory or there's a problem in some relationship and we have an idea about how to resolve it. And the mind clings to being the one to resolve that problem with that person or to become somebody, to become a wonderful Buddhist meditation teacher, the next Buddha. I mean, we have all kinds of things that I, I get sometimes caught in meta fantasies of just people doing really nice things to each other. And I get really identified, like I, it's hard for the mind to let it go because it's intoxicating. The attachment and that somehow, um, yeah, that, that that all that goodness is like mine because it's in it's like my own Hallmark movie in my mind, in my heart. And the and the wisdom, you know, when it's not strong enough, it's like, uh, is it really okay to let this go? Not it's not like stopping the movie; it's stopping the identification or stopping the ignorance than not seeing that it's just a movie. You know, it's just something the mind's concocted, whatever it is. We see that, you know, when we wake up in the middle of the night and we're in the middle of an intoxicating dream, and do you feel that tug to go back to the content of the dream? It's like, almost like a magnetic pull. That's what we're renouncing is the somehow wrongly, because of habit, the mind thinks it's going to get something from that identification, like with the dream or with the fantasy. You know, sexual fantasies are common on retreats. And, you know, whether it's, you know, more physical or more romantic, but just some, you know, things that are juicy. Another thing, too, I noticed on retreats is just, uh, 
uh, just imagining fantasies about like, because uh, I sometimes practice, I think Rob's been there, maybe a few others, maybe Cam up at Arrow River, which is very remote. And one of the cabins, you know, you have to walk like a half a mile through the woods to get to it. And I've done some practice there in the wintertime. So the snow's deep and got all your stuff on your back and try not to fall over into the deep snow. And and uh, so I just, it would periodically come up like uh, fighting off wolves or something like that. You know, and it's, and it's like, it's amazing to watch how much the mind holds to that, you know, imagining. Even though there's like, there's always going to be, you know, for people practicing some sliver of wisdom. Sometimes it's like 49% of the mind is wise. But as long as there's 51% that just needs to see where this goes, right? It will go. Because it's just a matter of the tipping of ignorance and wisdom. And just to, you, we really get clear Oh, it's, and it's not about that the mind had an initial flash that, oh yeah, there were wolves in these woods or something like that. But it's the, it's the building of a self and whatever is juicy for this self. What's juicy for the self? Getting what I want and getting what I don't want. Those two things, like I, I, I think I mentioned in one of the earlier talks from a wonderful West Coast teacher, Gil Franzdahl, Greed and aversion or the caffeine of the soul. And in a Buddhist sense, soul, like how we think of soul, soul is like our unfinished business. Like it's the momentum of being attached, the mind's habit of being attached to identity. Wrongly understanding identities. We're always going to use identities. Identities are really important just in navigating our social world, especially. But we don't want to get confused by the identities that are very useful to use. It becomes its own prison. So the, the other real important thing to say right at the beginning is that Renunciation isn't like the opposite of uh, existence or having a sense experience. It's really about how one learns how to navigate this embodied life. Because there's two ways that attachment or clinging show up. One is we cling to sense experience, trying to get something from it. But the other way we get, we're still dependent on sense experience is to hate it and to want out. Enough, just get me out of here. And we seek some kind of oblivion, whether it's through sleep or too much media or drugs and alcohol or just disconnecting because we feel betrayed because sense experience hasn't really given us the ground, the solidity, purpose, the meaning that we thought it would get. It's like Joko Beck, a wonderful teacher, says, it's like a promise that's never kept. You know how it is when our friends tell us about a great teacher they've come across, you know, oh, I listened to this talk, or a great healer, you know, oh, this person is an amazing shiatsu practitioner, or an amazing vacation spot. It's like, uh, and if it's the right sort of thing, the mind won't let go of it. Oh, that's going to save me. That's what I need. I need a really good teacher. I need a really good vacation. I need an exciting new restaurant. I need a pair of jeans that actually fit. You know, it's like, it, it's just amazing how that, and then all of a sudden, you know, the clinging to, this isn't okay, because there's this promise that if I have this, it's going to be better. And this is totally infects Dharma practice too. I mean, nothing is immune from this pattern in our mind. 
that's why it's important, you know, um, the Buddhist teachings are kind of a setup because it's a wisdom path and it's sort of like you need wisdom to get wisdom. <laughs> so that's like a bit of a setup. And the, and the Buddha wouldn't necessarily <coughs> give teachings about renunciation right away. And, and usually Shelley and I will give a talk on renunciation, you know, the first half of the retreat. But when we uh, <laughs> allow life experience, moment to moment experience, to tenderize our heart enough, we start to get ready to hear it. Oh yeah, maybe, maybe the real happiness is the happiness of letting go. And I, I might have mentioned this in one of our times, but it might have been a small group. But, um, you know, the Buddha talks about in life, we have to really understand what gratification of desire is. Gratification of desire is a real thing. When I had three cheese on the rye crisp this evening, which is one of those things I like, you know, the heart, mind, body felt some gratification. That was real. That wasn't, I mean, it's as real as anything is real. What's not real in the way the mind imagines it is that somebody, me, is getting something that they're going to then have. But that's how we see it, especially my first glance, you know, and you see, first I saw the brie, and then later I saw the rice, rice crisps were out. I don't know if they've always been out, but uh, tonight was the first night I saw them. And, uh, and you, you can just see that the birth of a little promise. Somebody's getting what they want, and when they get it, and they have it, they're going to have gotten what they wanted. But that's the promise that's not actually kept. Like, where is that gratification now? I mean, I can whip up that memory, but it's stressful to have to keep whipping up the memory, and the memory doesn't taste the same, feel the same as actually having it when you're hungry. And this is true with so many and we want to really see, so if we are going to quench a desire, like we really want to get to bed, and then we do get to go to bed, and it's really pleasant, there is some pleasure in being done for the day, putting the body to rest. But you can't like hold it or have it, whatever that pleasure is. Life just keeps tumbling along, and then it's the next thing, and then it's the next thing, and then it's the next thing. And I don't know about you, but how many minutes into being in bed before it's just same old, same old? And actually, a lot of the pleasure is in the moments before you get into the bed. It's not even lying in the bed. I mean, there's some pleasure, but it's just that anticipation that I'm going to get what I want. Because what really feels good is to not have to desire for the end of the day. Not so much getting to bed. I mean, that's nice. But it's like, it's like the, the activities we squeeze energetically everything. Oh, it's going to be so nice. And then when we get what we want, we stop squeezing because we got what we want. So this is why renunciation is a joy, because it's this understanding that non-clinging is a relief. You still get to do what you're going to do in life. We're just abandoning the clinging, the attachment, the identification. It's not telling you what to do. So if you pick up particular forms, like you decide to sit every morning for 45 minutes without moving very much, well, that's, you're doing that because you want to do that. And it can be a place where you learn 
that all of those impulses to move, like, oh, I really should get to work. I'm really hungry. I want breakfast now. <laughs> you know, you realize what those impulses are. They're impulses. And they feel like they feel. Sylvie Borstein has a wonderful line in one of her books on the paramis um, that if we, you know, does she says something like, this is a paraphrase, desire pulls so hard, it's surprising to realize how empty it is. You know, it's so interesting when you have more confidence and you're feeling a lot of desire and you do, this is why sitting meditation can be so good. Or with walking, it's like, Sometimes the strong desire, like, this has got to be enough. I've walked back and forth enough times. Somebody's forgotten to ring the bell. I'm just going in, you know, something like that. And to resist, like, to say, oh, this is interesting. Like, to really see it as a Dharma teacher. Oh, this is interesting. There's this very convincing, compelling impulse in the mind to abandon the walking or to move in a set or to like you, there's a little wisdom and you realize you're about to solve a problem in your meditation, but there's a little wisdom that goes, honey, do you really need to solve this problem now? This, this looks a lot like a distraction, like an off ramp. And then you, you just, you know, like the rationalization, you know, it would just take a second, you know, just, just want to get this down so I don't forget it or something like that. It's like the mind is so clever and quick. So we get all these opportunities to, that's why we use the form. No, no, no. You know, to the breath or to the body sitting or to hearing or to seeing or to the elements of what's here and now being known. And that impulse is just one of those elements. It's just that impulse. And it's amazing how much grieving and fear can come up. Like uh, I mentioned earlier, the mind's not ashamed. It will make it seem like it's life or death. No, no, you have to do this now. You have to scratch this itch or you're going to die. You have to leave the room right now or you're going to do something really embarrassing. You know, it's like it will throw out anything. And uh, what wisdom and awareness realizes is, I can just be with that. I can feel that. That what Shelley was talking about this morning. Well, what's the underlying feeling tone? It's really unpleasant. Well, can that be okay to let that feeling be felt? To relax with that too? Because it's so liberating to not be pushed around by the, the pleasure and pain, the liking and disliking. Doesn't mean you don't have to. That's why it's a training. It's not like forever, you know, putting the kibosh on our liking and making ourselves to do what we don't, <coughs> excuse me, don't like. It just means as a training, because we don't really get to see what desire is until we see it arise, and bloom and keep on blooming. I see this a lot with my cat, our cat at home. You know, usually we just let the cat do whatever it wants. It goes out, comes in when it wants, even in the middle of the night, we're kind of spoiled. It's spoiled or we're spoiled or both, but every once in a while, you know, like when I'm sitting or when I'm really tired, you know, and it's, it has this expectation and it's like this, uh, you know, it just, it just has to ask, you know, in its way. And eventually it kind of comes right next to us. And it knows, because especially I can be <laughs> physical. <laughs> it will very tentatively reach out its paw and touch our face. But see, we, you know, like, I mean, mostly when gives in, but, but sometimes it's like, I don't want you to be trained and I don't want to be trained like to be, and just, it's like, a, it could be like this, uh, 
locking of horns, you know. But for me, it's just really interesting. Like I really try to get myself in that place that I'm not afraid to get up and let you out, but I'm not afraid to hang out here with you. And just to, you know, like uh, sometimes you don't get what you want. And I'm okay with all your moves. <laughs> Same thing like when we're a little cold or a little hot. It's not like wrong to put a sweater on or take a sweater off. But it's just interesting how big that can be when we're a little hot because we've overdressed. It'd be so natural, appropriate to take the sweater off. But because we're in a kind of a meditative frame of mind, we just use it as a little like a Dharma teacher showed up. Oh, I'm, give, I'm being given this teaching. There is this desire. What is this desire? Because it looks so real. It looks like me, so compelling. But to see it for what it is. The Buddha says, uh, I'll read this one sutta. Bhikkhu Bodhi translates the title as Four Wonderful Things. Practitioners, on the manifestation or the arising of a Buddha, four wonderful and marvelous things appear. What for? <clears throat> the Buddha goes on. People, for the most part, delight in attachment. Take delight in attachment. Rejoice in attachment. But when the Dhamma of non-attachment is taught by the Buddha, people wish to listen to it, lend an ear, and try to understand it. This is the first wonderful and marvelous thing that appears when there's a Buddha around. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting. Because normally, you know, like if somebody wrote a self-help book about renunciation, you know, it's always about getting somewhere, even sort of relatively good self-help books. And then the other three, people for the most part delight in conceit, take delight in conceit, rejoice in it. But when the Dhamma is taught by the Buddha for the abolition of conceit, people wish to listen to it, lend an ear, and try to understand it. This is the second wonderful and marvelous thing. People, for the most part, delight in restlessness, take delight in restlessness, rejoice in it. But when the Dhamma of peace is taught by the Tathagata, people wish to listen, lend an ear, and try to understand it. This is the third wonderful and marvelous thing. People, for the most part, live in ignorance, are blinded by ignorance, fettered by ignorance. But when the Dhamma is taught by the Tathagata, the Buddha, for the abolition of ignorance, people wish to listen, lend an ear, try to understand it. So the point there, I think, is mostly, you know, it's really against the grain, what we're doing. And so that's why it can't be, we have to really watch out that we uh, approach renunciation from a superficial point of view. I'm trying to look like a Buddhist, you know, or I don't deserve a lot in my life or something like that. It's really a creative, probably the most creative endeavor. And it doesn't actually have to do, like even though we have these uh, very powerful symbols of monastics, like uh, Aya Nyanaka was here earlier in the summer teaching at the retreat center with Win Fricky and teaching also at the city center and other monks and nuns have come in the past. And it's very provocative to be around monastics if you haven't. And for those of you who are really into your Buddhist practice, I, I encourage you to consider staying at one of the monasteries, the Western monasteries that now exist in the States, Canada. You can check with me or Shelley will help you find a place or Gabe. But, uh, but to understand that you could be somebody just because of your karma where you have a lot of responsibility and maybe a lot of wealth and maybe even a lot of power and maybe you're also physically beautiful and on top of that you're really intelligent and you have a winning personality 
you may have all those things and you may have really deep understanding about renunciation and the joy and freedom of renunciation. So you can't judge someone's depth of practice by how austere their life is. And generally speaking, you know, picking up some of these practices of ren out outward practice of renunciation, like I said, are, they're trainings so that we get to see like we're basically people who are following the teachings of the Buddha, we're using life and the duties and responsibilities of life and just navigating being a human being with sexual energy and issues around belonging and power and all the things that come with the territory of being human. We're using those unavoidable parts of being human to illuminate what we're, we haven't seen. And what haven't we seen? That all of this is nature and not self. And so you can play each of us in our own way about how we might learn to respect those places in life that are outwardly asking for renunciation and just turn it into a teacher. Oh, I'm sick and I can't go on this trip. And, uh, you know, if there's something you can do about your illness, well, of course, do it. <laughs> but sometimes you're just sick and you can't go on the trip. So we feel, you know, in living color that desire and the attachment to the desire. And then we can use that teacher, that, ex that life situation, to see that the attachment to the desire and the desire itself they both come and go. Next time, just in an ordinary day, you can just experiment with something simple like, what happens if I don't have lunch today? You know, and the mind will just like, well, what do you mean? Are you crazy? You've worked hard all morning, you get lunch. You know, it's like in the contract. Yeah, but wouldn't it be interesting to see the mind's conditioning, like what a stink it makes. Or like, end of the day, you've had you've practiced as best you could all day long. Finally, there's that nine o'clock bell. You have every right to get up and go to bed. And you don't. And you, and you just notice wave after wave, like the cat returning wave after wave of the mind's rationalization, why now you should get up. Look at most of the people have left. You're, re you're already a good yogi. You can go now. <laughs> you know, and, and then you just see that. And then over and over again, you see what arises, passes. Every little juicy drama, every convincing rationalization that Desire ceases, the attachment to desire ceases without gratification. It's really a powerful insight. It kind of puts desire into its place. Oh, desire is nature. And sometimes the nature is really appropriate to listen to and, and act out. You know, then, then desire to drink water when we're thirsty and eat when we're hungry and take rest when we're tired. But sometimes desire, it's just not appropriate to act out for any number of reasons. And to have that power to feel it without being confused by it, oh yeah, there's a strong desire. So we have actually quite a bit of time left in the retreat all day, rest this evening, all day, Saturday and Sunday and early Monday morning. And just to think of these little places that our heart bumps up against, where there's desire and some attachment to the desire or identification with it. Remember, it could be the desire to get rid of something too, like aversion. And just to, almost like a little mindfulness bell goes off in the heart. Oh yeah, this is interesting. What happens if I just feel this? This longing, 
this aching, this whatever it is. The Buddha talks about the burning of desire. I'll just end with this little line from, famous line from Ajahn Chah. Some of you have heard it before. Do everything with a mind that lets go. Don't accept praise or gain or anything else. If you, go, if you let go a little, you will have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you will have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you will have complete peace. So just take a moment, let go of the words. Letting go, letting go, letting go. Thanks for your attention tonight.